Let's move on and uh, uh, talk about treating newly diagnosed multiple myeloma now. Uh, Tom, how, do you, uh, how are you treating your patients today? So my practice for the newly diagnosed uh, patient really re revolves around whether or not they're transplant eligible or not. Um, and I think in the U.S., transplant eligible is almost everybody that's less than 70 years of age and has a good performance status. And over age 70, it, they really have to have a good performance status to move on to transplant. So most of my patients are less than 70. If I take those patients that are less than 70 and they're transplant eligible, the two regimens that I really been using most are RVD, Revlimid, or lenalidomide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone, or KRD, carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone. My personal, I, I'm probably the most aggressive in our practice. My personal practice is if they're less than 60 and they have no cardiac issues, I pretty much take out, uh, give them KRD right from the start, carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone. Between 60 and 70, I'm more likely to give them uh, lenalidomide, uh, bortezomib, and dexamethasone, or RVD. And that's how I start therapy for most people. Four to six cycles in the transplant eligible and then go on to transplant. Adriana, what about you? I think those are definitely my two favored triplets. I think I would have to have a very strong, compelling reason to not use a triplet. Right. And the combination of a proteasome inhibitor and immunomodulator are the favored um, combinations. I don't think so much about transplant eligibility just because, you know, I think that was back when I would consider using an alkylator up front. Um, I think performance status is the, the stronger um, uh, differential. And then to your point, the toxicity. So I would avoid cardiac toxicity or a number of patients with diabetes or peripheral neuropathy from some other cause that I would not want to use bortezomib. Um, so there was some market research I saw this meeting that suggested about 70% of patients are now receiving triplet mm -hmm. therapy. And particularly in the younger population, maybe a little bit less as in, in the more elderly, maybe around 50%. But it seems to be consensus that that's the right, uh, the right track. Now, we don't have a head-to-head -head trial of bortezomib versus carfilzomib, but at this meeting, there were a number of studies looking at uh, carfilzomib induction. One I, I'd, I'd like to flesh out a little bit was the use of carfilzomib with lenalidomide and versus carfilzomib with cyclophosphamide. And Faith, I don't know if you caught that presentation or do you want Raphael to take that one? Um, so I was involved in one of the presentations, so I guess I'm a little biased in this <laughs> conversation. Is this the British one? The British it? one, yeah. yeah. Why don't you tell us about that then? So um, the, the British one was carfilzomib with um, cyclophosphamide, revlimid, and dexamethasone. So it's actually taking it a step further and having four drugs um, and comparing it to a triplet regimen. But um, the triplet regimen was an imid-based regimen, so either cyclophosphamide thalidomide index or cyclophosphamide revlimid index. And the actual question behind that was, essentially, if you, get a, if you can get deep remissions pre-transplant, does that kind of um, move forward to post-transplant and does it influence um, progression-free survival? And the, um, the study showed that it, it did um, influence progression-free survival in really quite a, a dramatic way. And I think the, the thing that um, everybody's been saying is that the, the, the triplet regimen, and in this case the quadruplet regimen, really does induce really good responses pre-transplant pre with many MRD-negative responses. So, um, and toxicity-wise for this particular regimen, the toxicity was minimal. So. Raphael, did you catch the uh, cyclophosphamide carfilzomib versus lenalidomide carfilzomib study. One of them was, um, if I recall rightly, had both two arms of transplant and one arm was just continuous KRD. Sure, yeah. I, I actually think that was one of the top abstracts for this particular meeting that Dr. Gay presented. So it was, um, again, uh, KRD, the carfilzomib lendex, uh, followed by transplant. It was four cycles, transplant four cycles, and then there's a maintenance component, which is randomized. There's, there's KRD times 12 cycles, versus KCD transplant, KCD four cycles, and then the second randomization. At this particular um, meeting, they presented the data for the response after the, the consolidation and before. The, they didn't present any of the time-dependent variables yet for survival. But very impressive uh, rate of com uh, complete responses, and specifically MRD negative, 58% on those patients that had transplant plus KRD. But guess what? KRD times 12 had an MRD of 54%. Yeah, I'm going to come back to MRD a little bit. But in terms of what's your personal 
preference if you're going to treat a patient? You know, I live in a, a bit of a, a schizophrenic world where, where I can understand where someone writing thoughtful guidelines will say that VRD is a perfect choice for starting therapy, but I have transitioned to use uh, KRD as frontline therapy for my patients, primarily because of the trade-off of someone who's going to live now, sometimes in the excess of 10 years, uh, to do so with a peripheral neuropathy. So it's, it's not a good trade-off. We don't have a randomized trial. There is one in progress which you should hear about uh, before, but it sounds like all of you are using some curfilzomib up front. Uh, Faith, the same in Arkansas? Yeah, no, but so um, obviously in Arkansas we add a few extra drugs into the regimen, um, but um, certainly, yeah, curfilzomib is, is um, really our drug of choice as an upfront regimen because I think there's now a lot of data to show it induces really good responses and is very tolerable. There has been uh, some concern about, you said you would avoid it in cardiac disease patients. Can you be a bit more specific? Sure. Um, I think the most uh, significant side effect from carfilzomib is uh, hypertension, and there is a small incidence, less than 5% of congestive heart failure. In, in my practice, if you um, control the blood pressure really well and follow it really well, most people can tolerate carfilzomib. We also do um, check laboratories, in, including a BNP level, just to see what the cardiac fraction is. Do you do is. that before you treat, or what, what's... With, with each cycle. With each cycle. Um, and then, you know, follow their weight. If you follow their weight in their, in their blood pressure, you can actually safely give carfilzomib for most patients. I, I will echo um, what Raphael said, that that was my favorite abstract. And the question now becomes, it's KRD without an autologous transplant versus KRD with an autologous transplant. The data look relatively similar in a very large study. But why, we're going to now we, add you, daratumumab to that. Why are you abandoning? Yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> yeah. why, why are we abandoning VRD so without a trial? What, why, is, why do you think? Do you think we're, is that a leap well, of faith too I far? don't think we have KRD versus VRD data, but we do have KD versus VD data. So you can, you know, it's an imperfect world, In and it'll be a long yeah. time until we have um, or probably never have the studies that we'd actually like for all the information. So most of what practice we have is extrapolation from, you know, imperfect data or phase two data. I will also say that Ola Lundgren did a review of the COMPASS study and looked at those patients that were treated with KRD versus... Tell, tell the audience what the COMPASS study is because so, they won't understand. That. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation, or the MMRF, has followed over a thousand patients serially from new diagnosis. Um, throughout their course of therapy, and they've done molecular studies from their bone marrow biopsies, including next generation sequencing, and also have done um, annotation of what therapies they've had, what side effects they've had, and what responses they had over time. So now we have this very rich and large database, again, over a thousand patients, and we can evaluate those that were treated newly diagnosed with triplets and doublets regimens and see them over time and how well they did. So when you went to the database for COMPASS and looked at those that were treated with KRD, and I think it was around 150 patients, versus those that were treated with RVD, which was more like 400, 450 patients, and I think that's probably right, that 25% maybe get KRD, but 75% get RVD at the current time. But if it looked at that, the event-free survival, and it, you know, at the first uh, year time point, it was better in KRD versus RVD. Now, this is not a randomized yeah, trial. Yeah, I was going to say, this it, is, I'm a bit dubious, but this is a lot of bias in how the patients got picked for treatment. Tremendous that. bias, tremendous bias, because maybe patients that are, were better P, uh, KPS were, yeah. were selected to get K, um, exactly, KRD. So. And so, um, you know, we do need a randomized trial. Yeah, exactly.